Well, good morning. What a wonderful thing it is to be together and sing praises to the God who is the great I Am, who created all of us and has put us on this earth to find Him and serve Him, sent His Son to die for us so that we can live forever with Him. It's a wonderful thing to be able to worship Him this morning, and we want to welcome all who are here to worship. Thank you especially for coming. If you're a visitor, we have quite a few visitors with us this morning. We're very, very glad to have you among us. I'm going to start this morning with uh, one of those two-bit words. It's a big word that some may not be familiar with. I suspect some, most of the young people are. But it's when you think about the God who is and who is the creator of all things, this is one of my favorite words describing some, something that he has done in creation. It is something that's enthralled me for some time, and it's the word symbiosis. I don't know if you're familiar with that word or not, but symbiosis, according to Webster's Dictionary, is the living together of two dissimilar organisms in a close association that is advantageous to both. And so, in nature, there are many relationships between diverse animals or animals and plants that are symbiotic. Uh, two vastly different creatures may rely on one another for important benefits. Often these benefits are vital to the very survival of both creatures. And it's one of the great things that demonstrates the wisdom and design of God in creation. It's hard for evolutionists to explain symbiosis. I just want to tell you that. How can you have, for instance, a bee and a flower, we're all familiar with this relationship, aren't we, that rely upon one another for their very survival? If there's no flower, where does the bee get something to, something to eat? Of course, the bee is getting the nectar out of that flower. That's, what it, that's about all that it eats. It's how it survives. If there's no bee to pollinate the flower, how does the flower survive? Because there's no way for it to, to germinate and, and have seeds and, and reproduce. So both of these creatures rely on one another. Now let me ask you, and as I would ask an evolutionist, which came first, the flower or the bee? Pretty neat trick for them to evolve at exactly the same time, right? <laughs> who, who thinks that actually happened? And yet we see these creatures dependent upon one another. And you see this all around creation. I have five examples on the screen for you. There are probably 5,000 or more examples of this once you really get to studying uh, the biological world. But you can think of the clownfish and the anemone. Most of us know a little bit about cl clownfish from the movie Finding Nemo. You realize that clownfish, however, don't swim out across the ocean miles and miles and miles. They're very, very slow swimmers. And uh, because of that, because they're fairly small fish, they're easy prey for almost any larger fish in the ocean. They, they could just be gobbled up very, very quickly. The clownfish live most all of their lives in nature in, in the fronds of anemones. The anemones have stings that sting all other fish about except for the clownfish. The clownfish are immune to those stings. So the clownfish can live in there safely. The clownfish will sometimes dart out and get a piece of food and actually feed it to the anemone. So the anemone doesn't have to swim or anything to get its food, the clownfish feeds it. So here are two creatures that rely on one another in nature. You see a picture on the upper left hand corner of a moray eel and a cleaner shrimp, a little tiny shrimp in the mouth of the moray eel. The shrimp gets inside the mouth of the moray eel, the moray eel lets it, and the eels normally eat shrimp and about anything they can get a hold of, but this particular shrimp it won't eat. It allows the, this shrimp to get inside of its mouth and clean it, pick out the pieces of detritus or whatever's in there, the, 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 like you know, going to the dentist and getting your teeth cleaned. And so the shrimp gets food and the eel gets its teeth cleaned. Pretty good trick, right? You have another picture here of a moth. This particular moth happens to be the yucca moth. It lives in association with the yucca plant. The, 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 this particular moth is about the only insect that will pollinate the yucca plant. And it lays its eggs inside the flower of the yucca plant and also gets its nourishment from there. So its association with this plant is much closer even than, say, the bee and the flower. Both of these are greatly dependent upon one another for their survival. And then you have a picture of a Cape buffalo and an oxpecker bird. Uh, when I was in Africa, I saw uh, oxpeckers on the back of a Cape buffalo. 
And what the bird does is it travels along with the buffalo and picks off parasites and ticks and things like that. That's how it gets its food. Again, the buffalo's benefit is it gets a free cleaning. It doesn't have those parasites and ticks and things uh, sucking its blood out. And so both of these animals uh, receive a lot of benefit from this mutual relationship. Well, this is symbiosis. This is two very different creatures helping one another along in life and often, de often depending upon one another for their very survival. Now, that's not what the lesson is going to be about this morning. But I want you to understand the principle of symbiosis. What I'd like to talk about this morning is something else, but it's based on symbiosis. Titled the lesson, Symbiotic Christianity. Now, neither of those words are in the Bible. But I think, of course, the word Bible is not in the Bible either. But I think the principles of these words are in the Bible. This idea of very different individuals helping one another through life. Within Christianity, and I define Christianity as the religion practiced by New Testament Christians. So both of those concepts are certainly in the Scriptures. And I'd like to talk to you this morning about symbiotic Christianity. First of all, followers of Christ, like different creatures in the natural world, may come from different backgrounds and be very, very different individuals. Who would think that a Cape buffalo and a little bird are dependent upon one another? See how different they are? Who would think that the bee and the flower are dependent upon one another? And even so, in Christ, we are very different individuals. We come from different backgrounds. Sometimes we come from backgrounds that are even hostile toward one another. You may have racial tensions, or you may have uh, other kinds of problems, socioeconomic difficulties and, and differences that rise up and would cause people to be at odds with one another. But in Christ, all of those individuals come to need one another and rely on one another. You know, the fact that there are differences between disciples of Christ goes all the way back to the very early disciples of Christ. You think about Matthew. He was a tax collector. He collected taxes for the Roman government to support this oppressive Roman government. You think about, on the other hand, Simon, who was a zealot, according to Luke chapter 6 and verse 13. Well, the zealots were all about the overthrow of the Roman government by force, if necessary. So here you have these two very, very opposite individuals. Matthew collecting taxes for the Roman government, and Simon the zealot from a background of wanting to overthrow the, the Roman government, and they come together as apostles of Christ. What a tremendous thing. And really, all the way through Scripture, we see people from vastly different backgrounds, often antagonistic and hostile to one another, coming together to work mutually together and help one another go to heaven in the body of Christ. Think about the fact that Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. John chapter 4 and verse 9 says, And yet Philip the evangelist and Peter and John apostles preached so zealously in Samaria and converted many in Acts chapter 8. All of these different people coming into the body of Christ. And once in Christ, the differences in background, in race, or social status must be laid aside. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Maybe one of the biggest religious differences of the day of the first century was the difference between the circumcised and the uncircumcised, the Jew and the Gentile. Those of us who are familiar with Scripture at all realize that this caused great friction and problems among the Lord's people as they tried to sort this out and be what they should be, one in Christ. Many times this problem is mentioned in the epistles, especially in the book of Galatians and some also in the book of Romans. This particular problem in Acts chapter 15, it comes to a head in the church. And people have to come together under the authority of the apostles in Jerusalem and understand what the will of God is regarding this problem. But Paul says in Galatians 6 and verse 15 that it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. What's important is that you're a new creation, a new man in Christ Jesus, and your relationships with people are now different. They're not defined by things 
like where you came from, whether or not you're circumcised or not, what your race is, or anything like that. Having put on Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 28 says that there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. You ever thought about the difference between a slave and a free man in New Testament times? Their, their entire existence was so different. And yet Paul says in Christ there is neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so it is that differences, even after we're in Christ, may develop in the course of working together in the body of Christ. But they also must be laid aside or resolved. There should be no divisions among us, particularly divisions that develop around personalities. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, using himself and Apollos and Cephas, or the Apostle Peter, as examples, tells the Corinthians, you can't divide over personalities or anything like that. We're all one in Christ. He says to them, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. When disagreements and friction arise between brethren, they must be resolved in love. And I mean they must be resolved, not swept under the carpet. No grudges held, but resolved. And so Paul will write to the Philippians in Philippians, Philippians verse four and chapter four and verse two. I implore you, Yodia, and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Here are two women who've gotten crossways with one another. Who knows what all was going on? Paul says, "Be of the same mind in the Lord." The point is, my friends and brethren, is that we need one another. It doesn't matter where we came from. It doesn't matter about our different personalities. It ought not to matter about friction that has developed between us that should be resolved appropriately through love and forgiveness. You see, in Christ, we're symbiotic. We all need one another. We all need one another. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. It doesn't matter who you were. In Christ you're all one body. And the eye of that body cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Do you see that? We all need one another. What part of your body would you like to do without? We all need one another. From the weakest to the strongest, the oldest to the youngest, whatever the differences may be. We have a number of important symbiotic relationships in Christ, and I'm going to take just a few minutes and share some ideas about some of those with you this morning in hopes that we can see how we can help each other and how it is that we need one another. First of all, I want you to think about just a simple greeting. How do, you, how do you feel when you're greeted? I've walked uh, down the streets of New York and I've walked in Walmart in Athens, Alabama. And I can tell you that the, experience, the experiences are quite different. When you walk in the streets of New York, it's hard even to get anybody to make eye contact with you, to acknowledge that you exist. And you just almost feel like you don't exist. You're in a city of however many, seven million people, whatever it is. And you just almost feel like you don't exist. You try walking in Walmart and feel like you don't exist. <laughs> you can't get away with it. Not in Athens. And people come up from all over the place, whether they know you or not sometimes. And they'll greet you and they'll talk to you. Try to go in there just for a bottle of ketchup and you spend two hours talking to people. We've all had that experience. How does that make you feel? 
Oh, it makes you feel good. We need that, don't we? We need that human contact, that human acknowledgement. And in Christ, one of the basic commands that we have is to greet one another, to acknowledge one another. And, and there's a, a, a mutuality, a, a, a mutual benefit that occurs when that happens. In Acts chapter 21 and verse 17, Paul and his companions came after a long journey to Jerusalem, and it says there that the brethren received us gladly. Don't you know that made Paul, made, made Paul feel wonderful? To be received gladly. We receive such mutual encouragement in knowing that others are glad to see us, that they appreciate us being in their presence. We have a responsibility. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 21. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but here's what it says. Greet every saint. Not just the ones I like. Not just the ones in my clique. Greet every saint. Here's something that you can do for everybody. And that you're commanded to do, really. Greet every saint in Jesus Christ, Philippians 4.21. 1 Thessalonians 5.26, it says, Greet all the brethren. And it goes beyond that and says, Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. That idea of the holy kiss is mentioned in three other passages and another similar passage. We're told in Romans 6 and verse 16 and 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 20 and 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 12 to greet one another with a holy kiss. And someone says, well, that was just their customary way of greeting back in New Testament times, and that's probably right. But I think the concept of it certainly does still apply today. The Bible mentions lots of different ways that we can greet one another, and we're not particularly limited to greeting one another with a holy kiss. I understand that. So there are other ways to greet one another. But the point of all, it's five times. Five times we're commanded to greet one another with a holy kiss. Think that means something? Not only to greet your brother and to greet all your brethren, but to show affection for them when you do it. With a kiss of love is the way that Peter puts it in 1 Peter 5 and verse 14. We all need to be giving that because we all get something out of that. It's symbiosis. And then there's this mutual benefit that occurs between the admonisher and the admonished. I'm using the word admonish here in a very broad sense to mean everything from rebuking to encouraging to counseling to exhorting, and it can be used that way according to my understanding of the particular Greek word that's used in the New Testament. But in Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 12, the wise man says, like an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a wise rebuker to an obedient ear. I want you to think about the connection between an earring of very fine gold and an ear. You know that earring is just as pretty as it can be, but you leave it in, in your uh, jewelry chest and nobody cares that it's pretty. Your ear goes around hearing just fine, but when ladies put that beautiful earring in that ear, <laughs> the two go together. The earring is shown off and the ear is made more beautiful. What Solomon is saying is that when rebuke is given to someone who will listen, it's a beautiful thing for the rebuked and the rebuker. The one who is admonished, the one who is rebuked, may have his soul saved by something that maybe isn't easy to hear, but that he needs to hear. I'm reminded of James 5 and verse 20. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. The one who is rebuked or admonished avoids become, becoming hardened by his sin. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13, exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest you be hardened 
through the deceitfulness of sin. And he gains wisdom and understanding. Proverbs 15 and verse 31, The ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. He who disdains instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebuke gets understanding. So the one who is admonished or the one who is rebuked or the one who is encouraged gets, can get so much out of that if he receives it humbly. And the one who is doing the admonition can get a lot of, out of it too. You rebuke a wise man and he will love you, Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 8 says. You gain favor from that person for helping them out, even though your, feelings at, your, your words at first may have hurt their feelings. He who rebukes a man will find more favor afterward than he who flatters with his tongue. And the admonisher also gets the benefit of perhaps improved behavior by the person he's admonishing. And there's often a great benefit to that. You see the connection? You see the relationship? How we need one another? We need to admonish, and we need to be admonished. We need to love, and we need to be loved. In the New Testament, the word beloved occurs dozens and dozens of times. There is no place in the New Testament that commands us to be beloved. But there are lots of places that tell us that we are. And what a wonderful thing it is to be beloved by our Heavenly Father and His Son and our brethren in Christ. To know that people love us. Don't you need that? And if we need it, shouldn't we want to show it? When we love our brethren, we proclaim ourselves to be disciples of Christ. For he said in John 13 and verse 34, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another, and by this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. In loving one another, we fulfill the obligation and duty of law that we have to our brethren. Paul will say in Romans 13 and verse 8, Owe no man anything except to love one another. If you do this, you'll fulfill the law. We need to be loved. And if we need to be loved, we need to love. We need to love one another. We need to be forgiven, don't we? We'll find in our relationships with others that there will always come times when we need to be forgiven and we need to forgive. Obviously, the benefit here of the one who's forgiven is that he receives, well, forgiveness, freedom from guilt, and acceptance by the one whom he's offended. But the one who forgives receives a lot as well, because he learns to behave like Christ. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13, we're told to bear with one another and forgive one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. Just as Christ has forgiven you, you must forgive your brother. And part of the reason for that is if we expect forgiveness from our Heavenly Father, He expects us to forgive those who are our brethren. This is pointed out numerous times in the Gospels, the parables that Jesus told and direct commands that He gave. If we want God to forgive our trespasses, we must forgive others their trespasses. And then there's the relationship between the singer and the listener. Again, it's a mutual relationship that we benefit from. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You know one thing that I'm happy about our services? Uh, one of the things that we don't have, and I don't think we probably should have either, that we don't have solos. We admonish one another. All of us together. Last week, last Sunday morning after our services, a comment was made, actually a couple of them, to me by some visitors about how beautiful the singing was and wondrously loud it was, particularly last week, I think. And everybody's singing and everybody's uplifted. We all know what we get from that. Therefore, we all must put into that. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. 
the giver and the receiver. You like to get things, don't you? Sometimes you need them. The giver enjoys the blessing of whatever it is he's given, but Jesus also tells us it's more blessed to give than to receive. There's a great blessing in giving. We need, we need to give. And in doing so, oftentimes we'll gain a proper perspective on what our material goods are really wor worth and a hope of eternal life, storing up treasure in heaven. Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. He says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. And then lastly, as we think about these points of symbiosis, and these are just a few really, ways that we need each other in Christ, we need to pray for one another. We need to pray for one another. There's this connection, this mutuality between the one who prays and the one for whom he prays. In all that we've been through with my health and my family has over the last few months, I, I cannot express to you my thanksgiving for the prayers that have been offered. Many other great things have been done for us. But there have been many times at this point when I've been quite certain that the only thing that was keeping me on my feet were the prayers of my brethren in Christ. We need to pray for one another. The Bible commands it. Jesus said in praying we'll be more like the Heavenly Father who sends the rain on the evil and the good. And by praying for one another, there's a benefit in praying and in being prayed for. I might say this about that as well. When it comes to praying for others, it's not just for their benefit. You all understand that? It benefits you in a lot of ways. But particularly, I think about this. Have you ever wondered in the congregation where you worship, maybe even here, we would go so far as to say, have you ever wanted better elders? Have you ever wanted a better child, a better parent, a better wife, a better husband, a better boss? Do you realize that the easiest thing and probably the most powerful thing you could do to make any of those individuals better and benefit your life is to pray for it. You see what you get out of praying for folks? The Bible tells us to pray for those who are our rulers. Why? Well, a couple of reasons are given, but one of them is so that we may live peaceably. It will benefit us. I believe that Christianity is symbiotic. There are many mutual benefits to be had in our relationships with one another. The oxpecker and the buffalo and the bee and the flower and the clownfish and the anemone all work together for one another's benefit because that's how God created them. In the same way, we have been created anew in Christ. Go back with me and think about Galatians 6.15 just once more. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. We've been created in Christ to work together, to support one another, I realize it's after 11 o'clock, but I have just one more thing to say. I've had different impressions of the church at Eastside over the years. In 1983, when I first visited this congregation, 
my impression was that it was a large, strong church, very interested in helping evangelists in other places. And I was very thankful for that as the church here supported me for 10 years in my work in Gadsden. Later on, when we moved to Limestone County, I thought about Eastside and my connections with it as a church that was strong doctrinally, that wanted to stand for the truth and its leadership made stands for the truth that I appreciated from afar. Eastside became known as the church with an extremely strong teaching program, thanks in large part to the great work that Bob and Sandra did when they were here. And it deserves that reputation. But only in the last year and a half in being with you have I found what the true reputation of this church is. It's people that love each other. That are willing to give and sacrifice and work for one another and hold each other up. This is our reputation. Let's live worthy of it. If you'd like this morning to be a new creation in Christ, we'd ask you to come while we stand.